Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Homesteading Off the Grid and another morning ramble. I'm sitting in the woods again today because the sun is already up and it's too bright to sit out in my field. But today, uh, we're going to talk about this crazy concept that, and again, this is something that, that pertains predominantly to Western society and especially American culture. We have turned our pleasures into punishment, uh, and we've turned our punishments into pleasures. Now, what's Crazy Lake talking about here this morning? Well, reading and running. I'm going to talk about reading and running. Um, if you are a loyal subscriber, number one, thank you, and number two, then you know that yesterday, as of this recording, yesterday from right now, my family and I took a trip over into the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, we went to the Green Valley Book Fair and we stocked up on books. Now we ended up getting mostly books for Daniel, our son, which is great. He got eight and then I bought nine. I only bought one book. Um, you, the comments have been amazing because it's amazing to see how many other people love reading. Um, and how many other people love similar authors, similar style books, and they were telling their stories about reading, how people, have, a lot of people have loved to read since a young age. Um, a lot of folks discovered it later in life, like me, and that's part of the story today. Um, I want to give a shout out to, I, John Hardin is the name I haven't forgotten, but I wrote it down just in case if I did. Because sometimes, man, between point A and point B, so much stuff happens up here. Uh, oftentimes stuff gets lost in translation. Um, oh, and it was amazing too to see how many people run around their place barefooted too. In yesterday's morning ramble, I was running around barefooted. Earthing, some people call it, others have referred to it as grounding, but I enjoyed it and I did it again today. But since I am in the woods, I put the Javiana flip-flops back on because there's briars over here. But when I head back down there to the house, I'll be taking them off to walk through the grass because um, it feels good and I like it. So anyway, John Hardin watched the video uh, from his homestead in Central Florida yesterday where my family, Dearly and Daniel and myself, went to the book fair. And he commented that he's been a subscriber for about a month now, but we've totally won him over with this because um, Stephen King is his favorite author. There in that video, we're looking at Stephen King books. I didn't buy any because I already had read them all that were there. Um, and I've got a couple of his in here on the bookshelf that I, I need to get to that were there. I didn't buy those because I already have them, but they're in line. They're on the pile. Uh, so John Harden, his favorite author is Stephen King, like mine. And then after we, well, and he also pointed out how he introduced his children to the love of reading at an early age. Like we have Daniel. You see the video, Daniel's seven years old in second grade, and he was getting super excited about seeing books he'd already read, uh, recognizing some authors, buying new books, written by authors that he's enjoyed in the past. It's wonderful to see a kid at seven years old getting that excited. I mean, I envision my kid gets as excited at the bookstore, as you saw, as a lot of kids do at the video game store, which that's a place we just don't go to. I mean, every now and then we'll walk into those places because Daniel wants to walk in and see what's in there and we go in and we don't know what anything is because that's just not part of our lifestyle. Um, so, and then John uh, Harden in Central Florida also mentioned that their family's favorite place to have breakfast is at their local Cracker Barrel. And as in the video yesterday, I mentioned at the end we we're going to Cracker Barrel for lunch, which we did. And I had the Cracker Barrel sampler where you get the ham and the dumplings and the meatloaf and all the fixings, three sides. I love their, uh, what is it? It's um, Brussels sprouts and kale salad. It's delicious. So anyway, enough about that. I'm here to talk about reading and write, or reading and running and writing and running, not food. So anyway, all these people were talking about how much they love to read. And in the video we made the other day about running, how to start running, people were talking about how they love to run. Um, I love to read and I, and I write and I love to run. Now I discovered running in my youth, fortunately, and I'm thankful for that. But I, I didn't really get into reading until later in life uh, as far as passionate and, and loving it. And I, I think I know why, and it's the same reason a lot of people hate running. Most people, at least in America, hate running. Now, why is this? If you go to a grade school and you look at the kindergarten kids on the playground, what are they doing? They are running, 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 running. These kids don't walk. They run, 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 run. It's our natural instinct as a happy child to run. Um, well, what happens? 
Why is it that the point in life comes where people hate running and they don't like to do it and they view it as a punishment? Well, because the point comes in life at some point in our youth where running is introduced as a punishment. Um, you get in trouble in gym class, you run a lap. Let's say you play an organized sport, soccer, football, baseball. You grew, you know, the group messes up. You don't do a certain, you don't execute a certain uh, drill correctly. Run a lap, take a lap. Even if you're in band, okay, and you mess up, you're forced to run a lap. Uh, the other night, Dearly and I watched the movie Drumline. I saw it when it was new, like 15 years ago or whatever, 18 years ago. We watched it again because it came free with our Amazon Prime membership, and we like to watch the, the movies that come with the membership. And uh, good movie, we liked it, but there was a scene in that movie where they all had to run 10 laps. It wasn't very realistic because that's two and a half miles and these see these ginormous tuba players taking off to run their two and a half miles. But I, I told Dearly then, I said, look, this is because I've talked to her about this. Here's an example. They're being punished with running. So this has turned something that is very pleasurable, something that is very healthy uh, into uh, something that we associate with being in trouble and being used as a punishment. Well, who wants to be punished? I mean, who wakes up and says, well, um, I think I'm going to go pay a $500 fine to the county today just to be punished myself. Well, you get it ingrained. We have had it ingrained in our head. You know, the thought of running is, oh, wow, what, what play didn't I execute correctly in practice? Or what note did I not hit correctly in band practice? Or was I talking to my buddy in gym class instead of listening to the teacher and so I have to run a lap? It's terrible, guys. And reading, because this is about reading, right? And and why I think Stephen King and, and a lot of folks, they hear his name and they're like, I oh, don't read that. Uh, I would never give that. I tell you, you're missing out because it's not about what he writes about. It's how he writes it, his strategy. And not all of it's his paranormal creepy stuff. He's written a lot of books that have nothing to do with the paranormal, like Shawshank Redemption. Um, so anyway, uh, okay, I'm just, the reading. You know, when we take English literature classes, either in high school or even in college, we are forced, there's a required reading list, right? And what is on this required reading list? No disrespect to these guys and girls, they'd roll over in their graves if they heard what I'm getting ready to say, but the most boring, mundane, difficult to understand literature ever written. But the professors, the people in the ivory towers, the critics, they think it's so wonderful that it must be force-fed to generations for centuries to come. Um, when I was in the Philippines for, for years, many years, um, and I was reading a lot and writing a lot because this is what Stephen King says in his book on writing. A lot of, there's a lot of people that follow the channel who, who are writers and they've asked me to give advice on writing. I said this again a couple days ago. The best advice I can give you on writing is to read the book called On Writing by Stephen King. He's forgotten more about writing than I'll ever know, and he discloses much of what he knows in that book. If you want to take your writing seriously, read On Reading and On Writing. I've read it numerous times, and I'll read it again because I always get something new out of it every time I pick it up. Um, but he says, if you want to be good, you've got to read a lot, you've got to write a lot. So when I was on the islands, I would read 10 or more novels a month and uh, write up to 10,000 words a day. So I went through this period where I sat down to myself and I, I was brutally honest and I said to myself, you know what, Kevin, you skipped a lot of classics because you thought they were boring. You need to go read, just go on a classics kick. And I went on a kick where I read probably 100 classics. Um, I used to keep a list of the books I read. I don't now, but it was huge, enormous, which isn't a word, but... I'm going to use it anyway because that's the best way to describe this list. Um, and some of them were so boring, and I could, but I forced myself to get through them because as a writer, um, I need to know what is good practice, what's maybe not so good practice, what to do, what not to do. And so I will – now, I don't recommend this for peop, to people who read for enjoyment. Um, if, if I was out on – if I didn't enjoy running, I wouldn't do it. But I enjoy it, so I do it. If I didn't enjoy reading, I wouldn't do it. But there are times I will read books I don't enjoy because as a writer, I know it helps me grow. So uh, here's some examples. A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man by James Joyce, Irish novelist. That was like pulling teeth getting through that book. It was like going out on a 10-mile run when I was out of shape. I finished it, I made myself do it, and I had to put it down and pick it back up many times over and over, but I just simply did not enjoy that book. Another one, Wuthering Heights. 
I enjoyed the story. I didn't necessarily, and it was written by Emily Bronte. I didn't necessarily enjoy the writing style. I forced myself through it. It was not enjoyable, but I finished it. The reasons I've, I've finished these two books, and these are just two examples. There are many. I did it because I'm a writer, and I knew that it would help me grow as a writer. Now, if I were a 20-year-old college sophomore or an 18-year-old college freshman, and I was forced to read these books, and this was, you know, or if I was in a high school, advanced lit or whatever, and I had been forced to read these books like many students are at a young age, um, I would not love reading and and i attribute my love for my love for reading at a later age to this type of uh, just like with running fortunately i fell in love with running early and i didn't view it as punishment even at times it was used as punishment for me but with reading unfortunately i, I viewed it as punishment in my youth and young adulthood and it's unfortunate now as i continued on my track of reading classics and there were a lot of classics i'd already read but i went back and read them again because it had been years since i was forced to read them um, i wanted to read them now and see what it was like to experience reading these works when it was my choice to read them and there was a major difference and uh, so i got into charles dickens um i love charles dickens he uh i i have two favorite classic authors charles dickens is one of them and mark twain is the other uh with Mark Twain, of course, as an American, I, I can kind of relate to more of what he's talking about. But I'm going to tell you what, Charles Dickens has the wit of, he's genius. And and I, I love, you know, um, I read A Christmas Carol, and that wasn't the first time I read it, but I did see it differently reading it as an older person. Um, here's my claim to fame with A Christmas Carol. My book, From the Graves of Babes, spent six months as Amazon's number one rated novel in customer satisfaction in the ghost section of the paranormal, very, very subgenre. But um, the book it beat out of number one was Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. It was just after Christmas. He was number one, of course. I knocked him into number two, stayed there for six months. When the Christmas season started coming around again, of course, he knocked me into like number 157,000 or something. He went back to number one and I've never seen that since. But, uh, um, and then A Tale of Two Cities, absolutely love it. Uh, great Expectations, love it. Um, I've read a lot of Dickens, a lot more than that. I just wrote those down as examples. But here's another example I'm talking about. Another one of my favorite classic authors is Ernest Hemingway. Um, Old Man in the Sea, for which he won a Nobel Prize in Literature, uh, was a wonderful book. But when I was uh, in college, we were forced to read a short story by Ernest Hemingway called Hills Like White Elephants. Many of you have read it. Um, it's, it didn't feel like torture. It was short, but I didn't get it. I didn't understand it. And so after we all read it, the professor asked us what it was about. Nobody in the class knew what it, what it was about except one young woman. And when nobody could answer, she raised her hand and, and, uh, the professor called on her. She said, it's about the decision to have an abortion. And we were like, what? And the professor was like, yeah, you're right. You're the only person in this class that can think. And, you know, he ridiculed us and all this from his ivory tower. Um, well, I went back and read Hills Like White Elephants um, a couple years ago just to see what did I miss. Well, I knew exactly what the story was about. And here's what's going on. And not that I've ever been with anybody who's been in a situation where we've, I mean, we've never... I've never made a decision like that. Um, I'm a man. I mean, okay, and I've never been with a woman who's made a decision like that. But my point is this. So much of this classical literature was written on a much more mature level, or the characters in the stories are at a much more mature level. Than, I mean, as a 16-year-old kid or as a 20-year-old college student, it, it, it was life experiences that were too deep for me. I, I didn't know what they are talking about because I'd never had those experiences. Now, as a man who's 44, who's, you know, been around the world a few times, fought in a war, lived in other countries, um, survived some difficult situations, had, you know, know what it's like to, to, to be a family person, family man now, um, I pick up this stuff that before I couldn't. So I honestly believe a, a big reason why a lot, why more people don't love reading is because uh, they're introduced to it as a punishment or it's something they're forced to do. I mean, it's not that required curriculum is a punishment, but if you don't enjoy it and you, but you've got to do it because you're forced to do it, 
you're just not gonna, I mean, you can't force someone to love somebody else. You can set two people up on a blind date and if they're just not clicking, it doesn't matter if she is so beautiful, she could be a model and that he is so handsome, he could be a model. If they're just not clicking, they're not gonna fall in love with each other. And reading is the same way. Running is the same way. Everything in life pretty much is the same way. So I was happy to see so many people commenting on the comment section about the Green Valley Book Fair. Um, they love reading also. And this is why it's so important for my seven-year-old son. Go back and notice in the video, I keep saying, well, we need to get to the literature section. I want to find him some literature he can read that's at his grade level. He was drawn to the activity books, the entertainment books, like the Avengers graphic novel, um, some other things. We got him some of those because if, if he enjoys opening those things up and reading him, that's what I want. That is so important to me because that means he enjoys reading. But at the same time, I want to make sure I'm steering him towards the chapter books. And fortunately, he already loves them. And there's so much good stuff out there, so much entertaining stuff out there uh, that, that he can love these things. And, and so it's really, it's on... Um, cruise control now his love for reading and just i'm just going to let it let it grow and enjoy watching it grow now i still do this now as a writer i still read the difficult stuff that might not be as enjoyable to read because it helps me with my writing and there are things i read because i'm simply interested in it like i'm reading this big old anthology on thomas jefferson jefferson architect of american liberty by john bowles that's to learn. I mean, you want to learn about something, pick up a book. And I wanted to learn more about Thomas Jefferson before I take my family to Monticello over there in, here in Admiral County outside of Charlottesville because I want to know what I'm looking at. Um, I'm enjoying the book. It's well written, but it's written as kind of like it. I mean, it's nonfiction, so it's kind of textbook is she. And so when I get bored, I put it down. I don't force it. Then I move over to fiction. I polished off Mrs. Peregrine's uh, School for Peculiar Children. There I was reading that. So um, I mentioned I got one book at the book fair. I didn't tell you guys what it was. I haven't started it yet. I'm going to start it today. Here's something I do as a writer and as a reader. It's a, a book called The Museum of Dr. Moses by Joyce Carol Oates. I've never heard of Joyce Carol Oates. I've never heard of this book. That's why I bought it. Um, it's a collection of short stories. It looks like there's five or ten short stories in here. I love short fiction. Um, I love long novels. I mean, like I said, Stephen King's my favorite writer, and you know he writes anthologies as a novel. Um, but I like the short stuff, too. So if I know, you know, I'm going to doze off in half an hour or less, I'd like to read an entire story. So, And by just picking up a book from an author I've never read, I have the pleasure of discovering new likable authors that I like and that happened with this book. I got this at the Green Valley Book Fair a couple years ago. It's a book called The Dead Father's Club by Matt Haig. Matt Haig is an English author like Dickens. Um, I would have never just known of this guy. I mean unless I was at this book or at the book fair. I saw his book. I gave it a chance. I love this book. Well written. This guy's an excellent writer. He's witty. He's got that English wit, but it's not long and dry and drawn out. I mean, it's um, it's a story about a father's worst fears in regard to his teenage daughter, kind of becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. Excellent book. Excellent book. So anyway, and all these things I just talked about and all these things I explained, this is why I personally think Stephen King is the best writer ever. You know, he's he's sold more books than anybody in history. Number two is Charles Dickens, and, and Stephen King sold more than twice as many books as Charles Dickens. Here's what Stephen King gets, and this is how he writes, that a lot of, you know, the look at me, look at me, look at me writers just don't get. And I'm not a look at me writer. I'm not smart enough to be a look at me writer. And maybe I'm drawn to King because I am simple. Um, you know, I grew up in Appalachia, and I'm not knocking Appalachia. I'm not growing up there. But I grew up in an environment, my point is, where people just don't use big $50,000 words. I live in Charlottesville, close to the university. And I love life here, but I didn't grow up in an environment where there were a lot of university people using, like, we went catfishing here once. And we got out of the water, and there was some guy there, and he said something about a catfish we had. We were bringing back some to put in the pond. He said, I heard they're very mucousy. Is it true? And Dearly, whose English is not her primary language, she looks at me and she says, Unsa, which means what? Wallakesaboko, I don't understand. I said, slimy. She's like, oh, slimy. And of course the guy was like, <clears throat> yes, I, I heard the very slimy. And I said, yeah, catfish are really slimy. Um, Stephen King says in On Writing, 
if you use a word that you need a thesaurus to understand what that word means, you're using the wrong word. Listen, people read for enjoyment. People who love to read, read for enjoyment. Um, you burden them down with a bunch of $50,000 words, you're going to lose your readers. Uh, King doesn't do that. This man has forgotten more about the English language than probably anybody alive will ever know, and he doesn't use $50,000 words. And the reason he doesn't, and he says this himself, is because that's not how people talk. He says it in the book on writing. I've seen him say it in interviews. People don't say, I heard catfish were mucousy, unless if you live close to a universe university but everybody else out there in the real world uses the word slimy so when king writes he uses the word slimy i do that too because that's what stephen king says to do and i'd say he knows what he's talking about now some of the best insight i ever got onto why i think stephen king is probably the best writer in the world ever i got from his wife tabitha who is also a writer she's also a novelist and i've read some of i read one of her books um, and she's a good writer she's not just stephen king's wife she is a novelist um, I saw her in an interview on YouTube say that what her husband does differently than most writers is that he introduces you to characters that he allows you to get to know. You get to know them very well. Then once you've gotten to know these characters very well, he then introduces you to the story and you stay glued to it because you want to know what happens to these people that you now have come to care about quite a bit. She nailed it. That's exactly what he does. And, uh, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm not tooting my own horn here, but you know, this is right now we're going on 22 minutes on this video and you guys are still here watching. Why is that? A lot of you came to this channel and subscribed because of the video that YouTube featured about the annoying neighbor in the crayon. We get so many troll comments on that video. They're like, I hate you. I can't believe I've just lost 18 and a half minutes of my life watching a video where you made a sign. You could have told this story in two minutes. I hate you. My wife asked me, dearly, she said, well, why did they watch it for so long? Why did they watch the whole thing? And if they didn't like it, why do they feel compelled to leave such a hateful comment on the end? And I told her, I said, honey, they watched it because they got hooked and they couldn't stop. They kept watching because they wanted to know what happened because they were hooked. And at the end, when they found out it was simple, they were angry because... You know, a lot of it is, and I'm not judging millennials, but a lot of them are millennials and they've grown up with this entertain me in two minutes or less or this 30, get my attention in 30 seconds or less or you don't get my attention. Entertain me in two minutes or less or you don't get another opportunity to entertain me. That's a millennial mindset. And a lot of that is because their brains have been reprogrammed with video games and social media and technology. Um, that's unfortunate. Hey, I'm glad I was able to hook into some of them and draw them in and hold them on for 18 and a half minutes. Sorry you got offended because you, listen, get, check yourself before you wreck yourself. If you watch that video for its entirety, you like hearing a story well told. Don't hate the player. Don't even hate the game. Change the way you play the game. Turn off that cell phone. Unglue from your smartwatch. Go pick up a book and read it. Pick up a Stephen King book and read it. Even though he tells the story in a thousand pages and he could have told it in 250, read all 1,000 pages because you're going to love the ride. It's all about the ride. That's why you hung on for 18 and a half minutes. You enjoyed the road we were going down. You enjoyed the scenery. You might not have liked the end because it was just a stop like that. Hey, man, it's all about the ride. So, you know... Go read Salem's Lot by Stephen King. I've read that book three times. That's probably my favorite Stephen King book. So I hope you got something out of this. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope I made sense. I make sense in my mind, but hey, like I've said before, they called me Crazy Lake in the Army. It was for a reason. But most of you are here because you are my kind of crazy, and I want to thank each and every one of you from the bottom of my heart. And again, it's time to kick off the flip-flops. And do a bit of earthing or grounding or whatever you want to call it as I come into the field here to give you your parting shot of the homestead. Hope you have a wonderful day and we'll see you with more next time.